Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the sixth chapter. I'm so glad we got this working. Hallelujah. I don't like that lapel mic. It just, and I keep, I, I've lost the puff guard three times. Or four. I think I lost it three times last week when they found it. Hallelujah. The, the, the headset just works better. Hallelujah. Now, you, got, you, got, you understand how old dogs are? Now, when we first got the headset, I couldn't hardly stand it because it was, it was aggravating around my ear. Now, now I can't hardly preach without it. Glory to God. Luke chapter 6. We'll be reading from the 39th to the 49th verse. And, um, hallelujah. And we're going to be ministering today on how to win when the storms of life come. How many have ever had a storm show up? How many, been, how many are in the middle of one? I mean, sometimes you come to church, you're right now, smack dab in the middle of it, all right? And, and, and you know, you've got to know how to win. Amen? Now, sticking your head in the sand like an ostrich and singing, drop, kick me, Satan, through the goalpost of life is not a winning position. All right? You've got, you got to be able to take your stand. You've got to be able to win at life. Hallelujah. And we have been made to be winners. Amen? How do you know? Because this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And now all these things, He's made us more than conquerors through Him that loved us. So we're designed to be winners. Am I in a Holy Ghost Word Church or not? No, that didn't sound like a Holy Ghost Word Church amen to me. It's not like the first church of the frozen chosen. Now, how many know we're designed to win? That's better. All right. Now, you do know this, but, you know, uh, saying amen and encouraging me is like sticking through a bull. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. And he spake a parable unto them and said, Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they both? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? So that's, that's really pretty clear cut, isn't it? You got the blind leading the blind, you're both in trouble. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? Hallelujah. But perceiveth not the beam that is in thine own eye. Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out of... Um, I just lost the place. Let me pull out of... Let me pull out of the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thou shalt behold not the beam in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, to first cast out the beam of thine own eye, and thou shalt see clearly to pull out the moat that is in thine eye, thy brother's eye. For a good tree bringeth forth good fruit, uh, not, a good tree bringeth forth not corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. Every tree is known by his own fruit. For if thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush do they gather grapes. A good man, out of the good treasure of his own heart, of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and the evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is Evil. For the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. Everybody said, the abundance of his heart. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will like him. Uh, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, and the stream beat vehemently upon the house, and could not take it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man who is without foundation, and built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So we have here Jesus, you know, um, with a couple things about the moat and the eye, you know, and to be his point here leads into good treasure in your heart brings forth good things. Evil treasure in your heart brings forth evil things. And then he goes into this and says this, this profound statement, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, I'm not talking about you're sitting around with 500 charismatics for their confession beepers going and you're just you're guarding everything you say just in case they catch you. Okay? Those were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. Those were the days, my friends, we thought they'd never end. 
We were going to catch you in a negative confession no matter what we did. And we would just people would sit around. I was right in there with me and, me and Brother Will. Today we will be called the squirrel. Hallelujah. If you made a negative confession, we'd jump on you and cast that negative confession devil out of you. You know, we'd say things like, I wouldn't say that if I were you, brother. You know, and uh, all that kind of stuff. We were just jumping all over. You know, it's, it's one thing if you got a brother or sister and they said, look, help me watch in my mouth. But you can't be the, the confession police. And we usually did that because we went through to everybody else that we knew what we were doing. It was really fine. Brother Bill. The, the hand didn't go up on that one. He just he had to resolve himself to the facts. You know, we, we wanted to prove to everybody we were word people. Well, you know, to be a word person is more than catching somebody else making a negative confession. As a matter of fact, it has nothing to do with catching somebody else making a negative confession. It is you catching your own, putting a watch over in your own lips. It's you guarding your own heart. It's you protecting what goes in and what comes out of your own, your heart and your mouth. You are the, it's you, you should be, you should be confessing, beacon, beefering. I know it's not a word, but it works. All right? You should be confessing, beefering you. Not me. Unless I ask you to. All right. So, out of the, you know, but notice it, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart. How does it get in there? How do we get that into our, you know, the, the, the psalmist says, uh, my tongue is a pen of a ready writer. Amen? And where is it? Right, right on the table of your heart. Amen. What we know, what, what we receive, what we what we receive when we hear the word of God goes in. Amen. And when you fill it up enough, listen. Let me say this: you need to be real, 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 real. If I say real, real, clear about this. The the mouth speaking out of the abundance of the heart has nothing to do with you when somebody's around making sure you don't say the wrong thing. Absolutely nothing to do with that. It has to do that when the pressure of life comes on and you're not guarding it, what comes out is coming out of the abundance of your heart. Amen. The other is you guarding and trying to, you know, trying to train yourself and trying to get the Word in you. But when the, when the pressure of life comes, are you here? And you're not guarding your mouth. What comes out in that pressure is what's in your heart in abundance. Hello? See, out of the abundance of the heart. See, we think, you know, that if we control mentally what we're saying, that's the abundance of the heart. No, that's, that's your mind governing your mouth. In that moment, to, to, you know, and this, 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 that is a part of getting there. But that is not the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. Now, I shared this a couple of weeks ago. Brother Copeland was um, at a winter Bible seminar in Tulsa. I guess, I guess it had been in the mid-90s. Because uh, we were still meeting, uh, well, when was when the Bible church built the building? Now, 89, 87, okay, it was before that, so it was 80, this was maybe 86, 87, somewhere before we ran the Bible church, the big, the, the big church building was built there. And um, we were still meeting over in the, uh, what, what they called the announcement center, it was the old skating rink that Raymond bought and added on to it. And they, the, the, and the gymnasium part, they, they started having a church, they could see 3,300 with, with portable chairs in the balcony and all this kind of stuff. So we'd have one of our seminar, and um, uh, Brother Copeland and Brother Savelle, they, 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 they would sit, they'd come in late. But you know, you know how chairs and that are. Brother, Co- oh, Brother Copeland, and they'd want to give you his autograph and ask him some spiritual question right in the middle of the service. Sometimes, and then they would leave early, because if they didn't, they, they all got around him and corner him, and, you know, uh, it's not the right, it's not the place. And they came to get ministered. They came here, Dad Hagen ministered. They came to get ministered to and, um, but, uh, so, the, right across the street from the Nasty Center there in Tulsa on, um, on Kenosha was a bookstore, a Christian bookstore. I don't know if it's still there or not. That's if it's not there. It was a Christian bookstore in that little strip mall there. And, um, and they, they kind of left the service. They were, they were doing closing announcements and stuff. They went across the street and both folks were in there. Well, and I heard him tell the story later. That's why I know what happened. I, as a matter of fact, um, I was there on that seminar and I was sitting in the back and they were like, you know, eight, ten feet away from us, you know, sitting out there. It was a little bothering. They, they, they don't need to they need to come get ministered to. And uh, he's in the to walk around, and he, he kind of gets he's up there looking at a book or something. He sees it. Cashier must not have been a Ray McGrath or a confession deeper person. He said, my God, brother, you coming down with something? And he went, no, I'm the healer of the Lord. He just went off about 15 minutes. Just went off. And then we kind of stopped. The guy was said, my God, you believe it, don't you? 
Yeah, this see what happened was he was tricked and out of the abundance that came out. He didn't start going, you know, let me see. No, you know, the Bible says, and try to think of it all. That's not abundance. You're working on getting it there in abundance when you're doing that, but it's not in abundance. Okay? And we've got to get to the place we've sown the Word into our heart to the point that it's in us in abundance. How many of you have ever filled up a closet to abundance? Somebody's coming over, there's clothes out, there's nowhere to do it. You can't, you just cram them in the closet, shut the door, and you go back later forgetting what you've done and open the door and boom, here it comes. When you bought the house, it was empty. There was a thing in that closet. But over time, you got stuff in there in abundance. I don't know what I'm talking about. I think next time I move, I'm just, I'm just selling everything. Selling her, pick up the few things you like, and we'll take, and then we're just going to get, get house clothes off. Dirty underwear in the floor, I don't care. They get it all. And go, That's not a picture I want to see. No, I don't either. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we have got to be, we've got to get to the place that we get the Word of God in our, our understanding our heart. Now, listen to what Jesus tells them. He says here um, in verse 47, Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and do, does do them. Do. I started to make do it into, into modern English. I didn't work with it. Does them. Okay. He, he that comes to me, hears my sayings and does them. What did Jesus give? He gave us three things we have to do. Number one, you got to come to Jesus. You ain't all that. You're not that great. You're not God. You're not the answer. Come on now. The reason you need to come to Jesus is you don't have the answer. So how do we give the answer? We come to Jesus, number one. You gotta come and magnify and honor and know he knows more about it than you do. And he knows what he's talking about. And he has the answer, praise God. And you need to stop trying to speak to tell everybody that you got the answer. Hello. Here's what I would do. I don't care what you would do. Unless what you would do. Hello. I give I hear people giving people counsel. And I want to slap Why? Because they gave him bad counsel. I heard people, well, you don't have to be the devil's doing that. Scripture in verse 4. I understand that you have to use wisdom in, in relationship, but taking the position, because what happens is you say, I don't have to be the devil's doing that, you're already on the, ready, to, ready to chop their head off instead of turning the other cheek. Jesus said, when they smite you on one, turn them and give them the other one. And what are most of us ready to do? Just call me Bruce Lee. Or Samurai. We'll cut your head off. That's not, that's not what Jesus taught us. Jesus said, when they slap you, turn the other cheek. They stole my money. He said, give them your coat too. And your clothes. He said they, they misused me. He said, double it up and do it again. But did you go one mile, go two. But most people, I think, hey, people want to counsel people. But you, you need to take care of you. Stop listening. The, the, the Oprah and Dr. Phil therapy session don't help anybody. The only thing that Dr. Phil has ever said that was accurate in talking to some people is, you're an idiot. Okay? His counsel is so messed up. There, there was a, 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 a man and a woman team. At least you remember it. Men are from, uh, uh, women are from Venus, men are from Mars. And they would go around and do marriage therapy. They divorced. And everybody on the planet is going to up these stadiums and these conferences to hear what they got to say about marriage. Guess what they didn't know? What they were talking about. Come on now. 
So what do you do? you got to come to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus has the answer. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He was and is and is to come. Glory to God. He's the second person of the Godhead. He is the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Glory to God. He is all and all. Hallelujah. So when you need answers and when you need situations taken care of, number one, you got to come to Jesus. Number two, you got to listen to Him. Now, I've had people come for counsel. What do you think I ought to do? Well, here, you know, give them counsel. Go right out and do exactly the opposite of what you said. Exactly the opposite of what you said. That's when you want to slap them again. I know the Bible says, lay hands on no man suddenly, but can I do it in a controlled manner? Hello. You know, and go, excuse me, I need to help you out here a little bit. Pop! I'm sorry, I was watching old retro skin bracelet commercials all day and just kind of came out. Got in there in abundance. No, Jesus has things to say. Jesus tells you to do. And most people don't listen to Jesus is because they don't want to do what he said to do. You think you're listening, you think you're at the Pirates of the Caribbean with the Pirates code. Remember, they go, it's more like guidelines than a code. Remember that? They think Jesus is more like guidelines than a code. No, Jesus' words are a code. They're the code to the believer. If you'll, li- if you'll do what He says, if you hear what He's got, you've got to hear it. And when He says what you don't want to hear, you've got to change. Come on now. Well, I didn't like that. Tough! we got people running around now screaming grace over everything on the planet. I don't have to give. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to obey. I don't have to submit. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. Come on, give me a stinking Word of God break. Because they're stinking up the Word with that stupid doctrine. The Bible says you have to give. I don't give, and I'm going to get anyway. Jesus said, Give it, it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. The Apostle Paul wrote and said, Every man sow or give according to his own heart, as he purposes in his own heart. For, and then he goes on and says this, That man you reap according to that which you sow. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. He that soweth, this Apostle Paul, great, everybody calls Paul the grace preacher. You know what he said about giving? He, he said, He that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Now, you can come in here and put any title over any stupid, dumb doctrine you can come up with and call it whatever you want, but the Bible has something to say. Jesus' Word has something to say. And the way Jesus said it is the way you've got to do it. But I don't like that. Get over yourself. We got all kinds of stuff going on in the church now. We got church to say that homosexuality is okay. Let's just bring them in. Let's ordain them in the church. I can give you scripture and verse in the New Testament that God said that for the homosexuals, He turns them over to a reprobate mind. Now, let me tell you something. He wouldn't even let some man sleep with his stepmama in the church. What do you think He's going to do with a man and a man, or a woman and a woman? Well, they got you know, we got to let you know, we got to let people do what they think is right. No, 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 no. God has a moral code and God has a word. And there's numerous verses. They don't. The, the King James didn't use the word homosexual. The Greek word was. And he says, yes, they protect, practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God, just like it does adulterers. How many people identify themselves as an adulterer? Hello, come on now. How many identify themselves as pedophiles? Well, that's, that's no longer the term. A new site. Let me tell you something. You better, you better get prayer, and you better get busy, and you better stop being stupid about stuff. Because 40 years ago, I remember watching videos in health class in, in 1972 and 73 in health class in high school, where they were showing two guys getting married, and you thought that would never happen. Now they are. And they, then we say, well, what about pedophiles? That will never happen. They have now changed the psychological term of a pedophile from a, from a pedophile to a minor attractive adult. This is in a, this is in a uh, doctor's journal. Minor attractive adult. Now, God's Word is still clear on these things. So what do we do? We do what God's Word says. Church, you don't get the opportunity to change the rules just because you want to make it happen for everybody. 
We're not trying to fill the church with back ends of people who aren't saved. We're going out and trying to deliver them from the sin that keeps them out of the kingdom of God. And then bring them into the church and disciple them and grow them up in Christ. Why? So they can be effective in the world. Instead of trying to come up with these monsters that make people feel comfortable. Jesus, Jesus never said anything that upset anybody. Have you not read? He got up one day and went, Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. He had over 500 followers at the time. After he said that, are you ready? He had 12. 488 plus got up and walked out the door. And he looked at the twelve and said, well, you guys going to leave too? And they lived up. Ain't nobody else got words of life like you do. And so they stayed. He lost a, he lost a whole church over one sentence. Church, we got to stop being scared to stay true. Why? Because I'm going to say this and I'm going to close and I'm going to move to a different direction. Every person who makes the statement that Christians are homophobes, they hate the homosexual, is a liar. Because they are, they truly are the ones who hate the homosexual. How can you say that? They accept them. They love them. They say, nope, no, 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 no. If you tell a person a lie that will damn their soul to hell, you hate them. You're simply telling that so that you don't get the back blow, the blowback of feeling like you're not open to their whatever. You're doing it for you and not for them. You're willing to damn their soul to hell so you feel good. You're a hater. You're the true hater. That went over big. Amen. So what did Jesus say? You got, he that comes to me, and he is my Savior. You got to hear him. And you may be thinking you got you got a hold on this, you got a hold on that. Listen, you don't have a hold on nothing if you're not doing, listening to what he's got to say about it. And then the third thing he said was, "Do it." Or does. It don't do any good to come to Jesus and hear what he's got to say and go out and not do it. James said, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. What? Deceiving your own self. What's the deception? The deception is if, if you hear it, Oh, I go to faith and victory church. We're a word church. We're a Holy Ghost church. We can scout. We who? Come on now. We do it all. We're, Pente we're, we're white Pentecostal. We're black Baptists. We got it all going on. Hallelujah. We roll out the front door. We hang from the chandeliers. Glory to God. I mean, we, we scoop up and down all the notes of the whole musical spectrum. Hallelujah. I mean, we, we drive the bass until everybody in the building can't even think straight. Hallelujah. If you come to church and hear everything that the Word of God has to say, you walk out that door and you don't do it, you've done yourself no good. You've got to be a doer of the Word. As a matter of fact, James says you deceive yourself. Why? I'm a word person. If you're not doing it, you're not a word person. you got to do it. you got to put it in operation. But I remember, I, I shared this last week somewhere. I wanted to either hear, I, I, now we're going back for a few minutes, and I can't remember where I said what. The brother, brother Cresslow, a few, couple of years ago, three years ago, I was listening to him preach, and he's talking about some guy, you know, <clears throat> Believing is not enough, is what he's talking about. You got to put action to it. And you know, these guys in the desert, he's about to die of, of dehydration, and he gets to a place and there's water there. And he looks at the water. He goes, I believe that if I drink of this water, I will not die. Looks at the water again, says, I believe that if I drink this water, I will not die. I said, I believe if I drink this water, I will not die. He looks at that water and says, he's going to die from dehydration. And he goes, heaven. Boom, he falls over dead. Why? He didn't drink it. <laughs> you got to put the action to the belief. Hello? You gotta, I mean, you're going to have to act on what you believe. And if you come to Jesus and hear his things, you got to act on what he says. 
Amen. And if He says, you know, I'm going to bless you, but then according to my word, what's His word? Give and it shall be given unto you. You're not going to get it if you don't give. No, I'm under grace. I'm going to get it anyway. No, you're not. If you sow sparingly, let me take that to another level. If you sow nothing, you don't get nothing. Hello? The Georgia Prophet, number years ago, that's about 1979, 78, somewhere around there. There's a guy named Georgia Prophet. He's in the radio. He says some folks send $50, and some folks send $30, and some folks send 20 Some folks even send 10 And he says some folks leave, send nothing. And he says, as the Scripture saith, nothing from a nothing leaveth nothing. There's some truth in what he says. You sow nothing, you get nothing. Now, I think last year we did not... Um, we didn't plant any college last year. We didn't only plant college in the spring and grow. They're, they're cabbage college, the Eastern Carolina South College. They're, they call for the cabbage in college, and they're a little sweeter, not as bitter as the uh, standard college. And uh, especially in the fall season, they turn yellow. Oh my God. They'll get you some salt in it. And throw in that pot. <laughs> and then you boil it for about a half an hour and get the grease and the salt and the pepper out in the water. And then you bring the collards to the pot. Hallelujah. And you stack them in and you just boil them. You boil them. You, you just stick this side of the pot when you start. And then they just keep, keep right on going down. Hallelujah. And then when you get them all nice and thin, you cook them down to the tender. You pull them out of the pot and you get that pepper out. And not, not the short one, the big one, because it burns the snot out of your hands. Now, and you chop them up, hallelujah, and you get some some fried chicken. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Homemade buttermilk, large filled biscuit. Some silver queen corn on the cob. Slap some butter all, and they're hungry yet. <laughs> get you some rutabagas. Get you some rutabagas and cook them and get them all mashed up, hallelujah. Mm. You don't like rutabagas? Lord, help deliver them that they ain't never had no rutabagas. Oh, Lord, here we go again. Yeah, we ain't never been invited. Thank you, Melody, for throwing me under the bus about not inviting you to our house to eat. <coughs> Every year I cook barbecue for the whole church. Well, this year might be in my backyard with tables in a tent. Yeah. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you know what? We didn't plant college last year. Guess what I didn't get? It's like one of those commercials. Two plus two is purple. You know? <laughs> but we, always, we, we didn't plan. Then we got to plan this year. I got about 10,000 seeds in a little bag. They're real small. We got them frozen. Because uh, in the way, you pull them out and plant you want, and they'll take off. We're going to plan them this year because they're just good. They're good. Hallelujah. But if I don't plan them, I don't get a harvest. The, the Word of God has principles. Jesus said, Come to me and hear. What did He say? Give and it shall be given. Well, I don't believe in that. I'm under grace. You're going to bless me anyway. That's not what he said he would do. As a matter of fact, he's going to give back to you in proportion or, or in relation to what you sowed. So if you sold nothing, you will get a hundredfold of nothing. That's just the way it's going to work. Well, I don't believe that. Well, go stop listening to people who have a really cool marketing scheme for their ministry and read the Bible. Hello? They can market their ministry. They can get you to watch their television program. They can share little sound bites. See all these sound bites that the Bible doesn't have. We're always trying to come up with something that catches, something that'll sell the hottest, newest, latest, greatest tape series, rather than make us a lot of money for our ministry. And you're doing damage all over the world and all over the body of Christ. You've got bozos that are listening to you like you know what you're talking about. Hello? No, read your Bible. He that heareth these things, man, and doeth them. You've got to come to Jesus. He's going to liken his house to a man that's built a house and dig deep. Anybody ever been down to the beach? You've got the house up on stilts. Why? Two reasons. 
wind blowing water in and water coming in from storms. And they, listen, what you see above the ground is nothing compared to what's down in the ground. Now, the, the sand with, with shifts all the time. So in order to, to build a house at the beach, you've got you to pile dry stuff down until you hit bedrock. Hello? Let me say something. You can go during a calm season, maybe in the late fall or something, where there's no storms, you don't have any noise to take place, no hurricanes to take place. And you can pile drive them things in there, you know, 30, 40, I mean, you know, 15, 20 feet, whatever it is deep, and not hit bedrock, and build your, build your little silt house on all that stuff, and it would look beautiful. And the guy next door to you took his and built it in and drove I-beams down into the bedrock. It may have been 50, 60 feet, 70 feet, whatever it was. Now they're going, king, 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 king. They get to a certain place to know on top of it well together. So king, 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 king. And so they can't drive it anymore. And then they set all the power lines on top of that. And build, build the exact same house. They look the same. Let Chris is working in it. I mean, you're going in, up and down the steps, you've got mirror houses. They look just alike. And then the Atlantic hurricane season shows up. And what happens? All of a sudden, here comes a, a Category 3 or a Category 4, and it's going to hit the outer banks. And you're sitting up there in your house, and you're going, I sure hope it holds up. Why? Because you didn't dig deep. Or you're deceived and believing, I didn't need to do that. Them storms ain't signed, it's not my house down. And uh, we, watch, we, we watch you float down the, float down the uh, inlet over there on the Oregon Inlet, on the hot top of your house, waving a flag, help, help. And the other guys up there going, he's still sitting in the same spot. Can't get to you. Sorry, pal. I liken him to a man who built, who built a house, dug deep, laid the foundation on the rock, and when the flood arose and the stream beat the heavenly upon that house, he could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Coming to Jesus and hearing his saying, and doing it is the rock upon which you build your life. He that heareth and doeth not, he's like the man without a foundation, build a house upon the earth, and against it, uh, which, against which the tree did beat the and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Why? There's no foundation. Christians running around and doing what they want to do are saying that, they, that they're going to get blessed no matter what they do. God's going to do for them whatever he, they, he wants to, that, that they want him to do. No matter what they do, built their house on the earth. They didn't dig. They didn't lay it on the foundation of the rock. And when the see, and nobody knows it. And, and most people still don't get it after this. But nobody knows it until the storm comes. And this is a disservice that preachers and other Christians do to other believers when they tell them to lie that you don't have to do it the way God said do it. Why? Because there's no storm when they're telling them that and everybody thinks they're lovely and wonderful when they're telling them that because that's what they want to hear. But when the storm shows up, their house falls. And it's only at the end do they know they were deceived. People don't like preachers like me who tell you you've got to build the foundation. You've got to dig deep. You've got to do what the Word says, the way the Word says, when the Word says, no matter what. But when the storm shows up, they're going, thank you, Jesus, I live in the past. Thank you, Jesus, I listen when He preaches out of the Word of God. Thank you, Jesus, He's pointing me in the direction to build my life on the Word of God because the storm is coming and I'm still standing. It's when you do it the way God said to do it. Not the way that sounds good to your ears. And the Bible teaches us that we will have teachers, we will have people who heap under themselves teachers having itchy ears. What are those teachers doing? They're giving what they want to hear for filthy lucre's sake. So that they can get away with not doing anything. And that works until. That works until. When is it worth until the storm shows up? And then you're not prepared. You don't have the equipping. You don't have the good. You don't have what is necessary to win. So I'm not going to, I don't lie to people. I don't believe the church should be lying to people. Just so you can have a following or have people think you're something great. It's all about your pride. Hello? 
They think I'm a great, I'm, great, I'm, I'm smarter than the pastor. No, you're stupid. A fool of the devil or a liar or all three put together. Hello? And where would it be? You got people running, you got, you got churches now that advertise they drink. And people run to the church and say, oh, whoo, I get the drink. The yeah, Bible says wine's a mocker. And people, and especially people who have alcoholic family members. That devil's running around your house. You better make sure you stay away from that stuff. He's trying, he's looking for a way into your life. Hello? We, we discovered it so tough. I went to Estonia last, uh, not last time, uh, time before last. Uh, which is back in the early 2000s. Um, when I first went to Estonia in 1993, about two years after the um, uh, falling of the, of the Soviet Union, Estonia was the first country, the first Baltic state. They, they declared their independence and, and seceded from the Soviet Union. And they're in Tallinn. And, um, and when I first went, man, they were hungry for God. Man, you could have a meeting, you could have a Holy Ghost meeting. They were fired up for Jesus. And it kept, you know, I went back, went back, went back. The third or fourth time I went back, uh, some of the people I taught in the Bible for the first time I went. They're so hungry for God. Oh, man, that's all they want. I mean, listen, Estonians are very stoic people. Americans make faces, they say. They say, because we walk down the street and smile like this. They say, we make faces. I'm up there preaching on top of the tables and all that kind of stuff. They ain't never seen anything like that. I mean, they're like, by the end of the week, they join me. But anyway, you got, you got to get the starch out of some folks' collars. Hallelujah. I mean, these starch them. Amen. But I went back. One year, and, and, and one, of, one of my Bible school students from the very first time I went uh, had me come minister in his little, little church there. And then we went, out, we went back to his apartment after, and he wouldn't talk. You know what he wouldn't talk about? That it was okay to drink wine. That's all they were, that's all they were doing was trying to prove it was okay to drink. Really? And I know Christians like that. And they'll, they'll pull people off of the church, and they'll try to get them... Tell him it's okay, and everything else he's going wrong with the pastor is hard nosed, and he's old. He's just, I mean, he's just stiff. Hello, you call me what you want to call me. I know this much. I know that I'm gonna walk. Listen, I'm not trying to walk as close to the line and get away with it. I'm trying to walk as far away from the line so I don't have to get away with it. I'm trying to get as close to Jesus as I can, not as close to the world as I can. And see, so we got a whole, the whole new church mantra is walk as close to the world as you can and you still get to go to heaven. And see, my heart for the Lord is I want to walk as far away from the world as I can get away from the world and be close to Jesus. Glory to God. He gave his life for me. He shed his blood for me. He gave everything for me. He came, he came to redeem me. Glory to God. He came to bring me out of all that junk. And don't, and listen, I, mean, I preached a sermon three years ago. I looked it up. It was three years ago in January. Egypt just ain't all that. Remember Israel? For 400 years, they screamed, squalled, and bawled. We want to be delivered! We want to be delivered! We want to be delivered! They got delivered, went one hard place. Let's go back to Egypt! Let's go back to Egypt! Let's go back to Egypt! Hello? You got delivered from the things of the world? Now you will start seeing how far you can get back to the world. Heard one preacher, I heard about one preacher said that, that they had to leave that stuff alone for a season until they matured. Now they've gone back to it. Well, don't smoke your stove and drink your, your rum. You're not going to help deliver people. We're, here, we're, we're called to walk with Jesus. I'm, and listen, I, I, know, I know from experience. I know a guy, um, when we were back in our other city, he, he, he ran a pizza restaurant. He was the manager of a pizza chain restaurant. Now, there's, there's numerous ones. Like, you don't know which one I'm talking about, but he, he's the manager there. And, uh, you know, you know, for some reason, people love beer with their pizza. I like Coca-Cola with my pizza. I don't want to eat, but I can't taste. You know, after enough beer, you can't taste nothing. Except that nasty sweat that's coming out of your pores. Hello. Y'all know, yeah. You've been some places. But he, he, wanted to, he wanted to drink. So he went and got the called near beer. You know what near beer was? It was back in the, back, back in the 80s that came out with a, what they called near beer. And it was... 0.05% alcohol. It was like so little alcohol in it, you'd have to drink a barrel to get a buzz. But it, but, but it had the flavor 
had a little bit of a tingle on the tongue from the alcohol. But you know what he's doing? You know what happened to him next? He won't drink in three. He won't drink in point five. He was drinking three two. And if you could find six four, he was finding that for sure. And left the church. What happened? Egypt called him, and he went back. He went back to Egypt. And, and see, we, we're 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 coming out of Egypt. Remember, remember that song Titanic Glory does? It's band believers in the song Band of Believers. He brought them out of Egypt, and he couldn't ever get Egypt out of them. Now, I grew up Pentecostal. Holy Moses. Okay. So you know what I'm talking about. We believe... Listen, I know we have some crazy things. And women with the beehive hair dudes and no makeup and all that stuff. But the point was this. you got to live holy before God. Jesus demands to live holy before God. Come out from among them and be you separate, Lord, and touch you not the unclean thing. So when the Lord calls us to something and says, do it, so here's what I had to say about it, then do what He has to say. So you can... Everybody wants the blessings. If we were having a get-rich-quick overnight supernatural debt cancellation, you have one dollar, you're going to get a million dollar return, and after this offering today seminar, they'd be, they'd be out of the parking lot. Why? Because people want the blessings. Are you here? But most people don't want to pay the price that the blessing demands. And listen, it's too hard of a price. It's if you follow the way the Lord says these things and not do it your way. The kingdom of God is not a frank synopsis. I did it my way. Is that okay? It was all right. That's all right. Can you do it better? Of course you can. Maybe you tell the frank you really good. You know? And Elvis did a version of it. <laughs> anyway, your way is not the way. I think all your parents told you one time, your way or the, my way or the highway. It's the way the Lord said do it. If you want the blessing of the Lord, you do it the way the Lord said do it. Well, I don't believe that. That's your choice. But let me tell you what you're not going to get. The blessing. It's not going to come on you if you don't do what God says. You've got to come to Jesus. And Jesus said, He that comes to me, here's my thing, and do with them, I'll tell you what he's like. He digs deep. He digs deep into the Word. He goes into the, the, the good steward of the Word. He digs into the mysteries of God. Builds his house on that foundation. Jesus Christ himself being the chief point. The chief apostles, the prophets, but Jesus is the chief point. Hallelujah. And he says, you do it this way. Then what do you do? Ever work with a piece of equipment? Never put your hand right here. Why? Because it's dangerous. Now, my dad was, was a machinist supervisor at Burr's Welcome. And, and, then, and then how many of ever you see the fit? Or Neosporn. Now, Neosporn is now owned by Glaxo's. Smith Klein or whatever, but it was it was originally owned and produced and discovered by Burroughs Welcome. Well, actually, bought Burroughs Welcome down about 25 years ago. Uh, but Burroughs Welcome, he worked for Burroughs Welcome. They're the manufacturer went down in Greenville. The researchers in Raleigh. They moved down here out from New York uh, when I was in high school, so, uh, almost 40 years ago. Um, but they got bought out and uh, so forth. But um, he was a machinist supervisor. They would watch safety things. Men were not permitted to wear their wedding rings while they were working. Why? It was a safety hazard. And they had just watched the safety video about not wearing your wedding ring at work. Well, that's not my, the, my wife wants me to wear it because she don't want no women hitting up on me. I mean, get your piece of paper, paper and say, I'm married to something, but don't wear your ring. Why? When the machinist went to an electrical box, stuck his hand in there to do something, hit the gold is a superconductor. Hit, hit the live wire in there and welded his finger and cooked that finger. He did lose that finger, by the way. Cooked it. Well, I don't believe I have to do it that way. Well, stupid, you found out, didn't you? 
Somebody knows one time once says, you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. Now look, he was dumb, he had to be tough. He lost his finger from a work-related accident. And I don't even know in that case if he would, would be able to get anything because he violated the safety rules. Hello? The barbecue restaurant I worked at, the very first day they were, I wasn't working there, the very first day they were open back in 1969, the guy was out there cleaning up the, uh, the, where they chopped the barbecue and stuff, and they had one of those wean Hobart blades. They took the meat there and chop it up, not a hand chop it, but then they used to up chopping. Stuck his hand up there and washed it off and hit something with his rubber and turned it on in it. It took place, you know, it was sharp as a razor blade. That thing, that thing, that thing, part of that one, and part of the thumb. Just like that. Now, you know what to do now? That thing's got a, got a safety switch off. They have to turn that off. They have to unplug it. Can't even leave it. Can't even touch the safety switch. It's unplugged. Why? Why? Well, if some buzzer doesn't unplug it back in and turn it off and hit it and cut the thing off, it's because they, don't, they, they didn't do what they were told to do. The Word of God tells us. How, now, it's not, it's not just warnings on what not to do to, get, to, to avoid tragedy and stuff. There are things we're told to do to be blessed. See? In other words, God tells us how to do things, and we have to do it the way God said to do it. Amen? And I'm not going to finish here today, uh, because... Don't we finish? You're going to pack up in ten minutes. Do it. Just do it. Okay. you got to dig deep. you got to... And we're going to come back and cover some of these things next week. The rock foundation is God's Word. You have to interpret all Scripture through Jesus. You cannot interpret Scripture through people who wear skinny jeans. I just see a funny guy. I'm sorry, you're not going to see me in skinny jeans. Now, son, see, now all y'all got something else to be thankful for. Pastor is never going to show up in skinny jeans. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.